You're listening to Satellite Sisters. What's a satellite sister? The person you call when the best thing in your life happens or the worst. The person that gets you up, gets you going, and gets you through. And every once in a while, changes your mind. This podcast is part pep talk, part weekly check-in. Like grabbing coffee with a friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Satellite Sisterhood. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. We're happy you're here today. I'm Leanne Dolan in Los Angeles. I'm a writer and producer. I have a husband, two boys, and a big dog. I'm Liz Dolan. I'm here with Leanne in the Wondery Studios in West Hollywood, California. I'm an on-again, off-again corporate executive. I have a dog named Hooper, and I live in Santa Monica, California. Hi, I'm Julie Dolan. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm the oldest sister. I've lived and worked in a few unusual places around the world. I'm an empty nester, an urban nana with five grandchildren, and no dogs at the moment. We are so happy that you're here listening to our holiday special on Family Dynamics. If you're new to Satellite Sisters, just attracted by Al and Alda, and who doesn't love Al and Alda? Who doesn't then, love Al and Alda? Then, uh, fantastic. We're so happy to have you here. If you're interested about us, you can go to SatelliteSisters.com. But we decided to do this bonus episode because we know a lot of you are getting ready to gather with family and friends throughout the holidays, and we wanted to provide some inspiration to make the best of that time. We know that things can get tense, America, (laughs) but we grew up in a house with eight kids, two parents, many different views on many different things. And our mom used to say to us growing up, can't you just try and be pleasant? And I think that's a good (laughs) motto for the next few weeks here in America. Yes, we can. We think it's worth the effort. Right. I mean, we've always said at Satellite Sisters that the sense of connection is the most important sense we have. I mean, that's really what gives meaning to our lives. But let's face it, it's not always easy to stay connected. And it's high stakes at Thanksgiving, whether it's bickering about how much butter to put in the mashed potatoes or what the seating arrangement's going to be and who gets to sit next to the relative, you know, you almost came to blows with. But it's going to take some effort on your part. (laughs) On all of our parts. So that's That's why our coach and inspiration today is Alan Alda. Of course, we all know Alan Alda as a television actor and everything from the classic groundbreaking MASH to West Wing to 30 Rock. He's been in everything and spent decades in film and theater as well. And, you know, we thought of him because we last welcomed him on Satellite Sisters when he came to our studio to talk about his second memoir, which is called Things I Overheard While Talking to Myself. And in that book, he weaves together advice from the speeches he does publicly with sort of personal recollections about his life and his beliefs. In the meantime, he launched the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University in New York. And just this year, he began a podcast we love called Clear and Vivid, which is all about teaching us how to communicate more powerfully and more thoughtfully with everyone in our lives. So we connected with him at his office in New York, and I asked him, do you feel like you and your family are good at communicating? Because you write and speak so beautifully on the importance of really listening. Thank you. And and not only that, now I have a whole podcast devoted to it. So you'd think I'd be an expert at it. Yes, yes. But, but I have the same problems that everybody else does. I was having a conversation yesterday where it was very important to make use of the tools I had learned interviewing a hostage negotiator on my podcast. Mm -hmm. And he had these incredible techniques, like you never try to get the other person to say yes. You try to get them to say no Hmm. because Uh they feel more comfortable saying no. He said they'd rather have their fingernails pulled out than tell tell the— the person they're negotiating with, yes. Oh. So, so I had this conversation where it was really important that I get the other person comfortable and that we get into some agreement. And I totally forgot all the techniques the hostage <laughs> negotiator taught me. I, st- I was trying to get them to say yes. I was trying to get them to say you're right. Mm-hmm. Where he has this wonderful thing where he says, don't try to make them say you're right. Try to make them say that's right. Oh, then they're wow. not giving in. They're not giving in to you. They're, they're exercising their power. I mean, the, the, he and, and other people I talk to on that show are a tremendous education. If only I could get the exams right. The final exam I don't do so well <laughs> in. Yeah. 
Well, we're all constantly learning about this. I mean, we've loved all of the episodes of Clear and Vivid. You're our new go-to expert on communication. I know I talk to experts. I'm not so much the expert. I'm very good at asking questions and yes. listening. Yeah. But it's, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a testament to the fact that it's hard to communicate. And you got to really concentrate on, on what you think is the, are the important elements. You know, like listening and letting the other person know they're being listened to. And it's, it's hard to do. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I learned from, from improvisation, yes and, which is now is pretty much entering the national uh, vocabulary. People mm-hmm. pretty much know what you mean by yes and. You don't say yes but, you, you don't say no. You say, yes, that's, I, see, I see what you're saying. And if you add this element, maybe we could even agree on that. Mm-hmm. And it's, but it's hard to do. You get into a situation and you hear yourself saying, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> that's the end of it. <laughs> but, but, I, stand, but, but is a good stand-in for no. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's a good lesson. Try never to say but. You know, yeah. but you've also said so often... That the imp- you need you're a big believer in listening, but that we all need to be willing to be changed by what we hear. And Ellen, I'd say that first part sounds pretty good, but the second part, I don't know. There are plenty of areas where I don't want to be changed. Well, you don't have to be changed by agreeing with the person you're talking to. Every time anybody hears that, and by the way, I know how radical it is or how radical it sounds, but it's. It's really, I think it's at the heart of making a connection with another person. If you're willing to be changed, it doesn't mean that you decide to change, but you, you're, you enter into this willing to be changed at some deep level. And the person says stuff that you regard as malarkey, let's say, <laughs> or, or let's start with something more positive. They say something you haven't heard before. And you think, wait, that may be really interesting to take into account. Maybe I'll expand my thinking, my feelings uh, around that idea. Well, that's not so hard to do. But if they say something that sounds dumb or crazy or just so opposed to your core values, you can't agree with it, but you can be willing to be changed by the other person in some deeper, different way, like how heartfelt they are about it, how much they think they care about the country or the cosmos or whatever they're talking about, however much they're trying to understand things. If they tell you vaccination leads to autism, for God's sake, don't agree with it, but you might be able to be changed by it, by the connection you make with the other person. And that connection might lead to their reviewing how they feel about that issue. But arguing with them is probably a definite no-go. It's not going to work. Let's play that out at, say, the Thanksgiving dinner table. (laughs) You know, lots of people go home with this dread that, Oh my God! You know it's going to be the politics that come up, or yeah. Well, the first thing to, for, the first thing to remember is at the Thanksgiving table when politics come up, put the knives away. That's the first, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's not be foolish. So, so okay. So go ahead. So now the, the politics comes up because the more you corner them, the more they're going to let you know what they believe is true, and it's just going to be an immovable force or what do you call that? An irresistible force and an immovable object or whatever they say. Mm -hmm. So I think looking for the connection, looking for what you can agree on, looking for accepting one another's innocence in a way and not ascribing a bad and evil intent to the other person, I, I think is a better start than launching into an attack. I've seen it happen over and over again with people of goodwill. As soon as they hear two words from the other person, they know exactly where they stand on everything, which is not necessarily true. And they argue against the stereotype instead of talking to the person in front of them. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's so true. 
I th- I th- Leanne, you have a question? I was very moved by your interview with Father Greg Boyle, who is one he, of my heroes. I love he's, him. He's and great. He, oh, could you make him the Pope? Can, <laughs> what can we do? Can we get that? We're to- campaigning. <laughs> I, I, you know, I would, I would vote for him, but I'm in line for Popehood myself. So, oh, you, know, yeah. you could be co-popes, and that would no, be awesome, because co- I know you're busy. <laughs> So what but, about him? Tell, what, what did you well, What did you learn I, from that? I actually listened to the conversation twice because I had to go into a very tough situation. I was nervous about some, being with someone I hadn't been with for a while, and his advice was try tenderness. He said mm. something like communication or understanding is the goal, but tenderness is the methodology. Mm. And I thought that was brilliant because you you just don't think of tenderness as a communication tool but it was a very loving thoughtful very humble place to start you and know don't a you, communication with don't someone. you think that would be a good way to approach crazy uncle louis at the thanksgiving table mm-hmm. yes I mean, mm-hmm. I mean if he's especially if he's uncle louis he's an uncle he's somebody you're related to somebody you want to have a good relationship with and i think father boyle's idea about really going for tenderness is a great idea should be easier to do with a relative than with a stranger. Yeah. And part of that point is also about humility. And I think that's what we have a hard time with, with people we think we already know we disagree with, right? So we don't go into a conversation with them trying to be tender and humble. We do exactly the opposite, trying to prove a point in some way that we've never successfully done that, done before. Yeah, but you it's true. I, that's where, where I'm headed. But I think you started off with a really good approach, which was to be almost cynical about this, because it sounds touchy-feely. Therefore, it doesn't sound legitimate to me. But if you think of them as techniques to try and really see if they work, and not as something where you go all gooey with the other person, which is (laughs) not, not really productive, I don't think, but a true, sincere effort to meet them at some level, on some ways, at some place where you can find agreement. I think you have a better chance. Mm -hmm. It's good advice. You know, no matter who your guest is on Clear and Vivid, whether you're talking to an author or a scientist or that hostage negotiator was fascinating, you, Alan, you always come back to the importance of empathy. And so what does that mean to you? And why is empathy is so fundamental to the way you approach these communications? I think empathy is largely misunderstood because it's understood to mean many different things. Almost everybody who uses it has their own special definition. So to kind of be clear about what I mean when I bring it up in these conversations, I I have to point out that I'm not talking about compassion or working toward the well-being of another person. I'm only talking about having a good estimate of what they're going through, mainly emotionally. Yeah, it's not compassion. It can lead to compassion. If you have an impulse to be compassionate, the best way to get there is to know what's going on in the emotional life of the other person. What's that other person feeling right now? Uh, Some people include in the notion of empathy what they call cognitive empathy, which is having an estimate of what they're thinking. But it's only going to be an estimate because you can't really be inside somebody's head. But to a great extent, to a surprising extent, you can read another person's mind if you pay attention to their body language, to their tone of voice, even their choice of words. What are they leaving out? Where are they looking when they talk to you? What are they going through? And when you connect with what's happening inside them, you have a much better chance to find agreement, to find ways in which it's not necessary to be at one another's throat. Do you think you learned these skills and you're good at this because you're an actor? Yes, I do. I do. Not because all actors are empathetic or all actors are, are better at finding agreement. But when you're on the stage, you have an obligation. You can't act, or at least you can't act very well, unless you're making really good contact with the other actor. And the audience picks up on that. They see what they believe are two real people interacting. And that only happens if you're 
really tuned in to the other person, really reading them as fully as possible. And what happens then is what we were talking about before, which is the idea that you can be changed by the other person. That's where I got the idea about the willingness to be changed. Because if you go in saying to yourself, I figured out how to play this part. I know my lines. I know my emotional geography. I know where where I'm going to go from here to there. No matter what the other person says to me, I'm going to take those lines of that other person as my cue to say and behave the way I decided to. You're not leaving open the possibility of life happening between you. Life happens when you actually are changed by the way the other person behaves toward you or the way the other person says something, the the tone of voice or the, the emotion behind it. If you fail to let that in and let that change you, then you're just giving me a report. You're giving the audience a report about how you decided to play the part. You're not in it. You're not doing it. You're not alive. I don't want to see a report about what you figured out last night. I want to see life happening right now. And that, I think, can be translated into human interactions off the stage as well, at the Thanksgiving dinner table. Sure. You can imagine in any family dynamic, I'm thinking about our family, there are eight kids in our family, and it it is, if you're not careful, it can be a performance because you're kind of locked in. You're locked into a character in some families, maybe not just us, but I think in most families, the the fear about being all together is that you're supposed to be playing this role of someone that you used to be or you know that other person did this to you 20 years ago and you're you're not living in the moment the way you just described. You're sort of coming in, like having memorized the role of you in a way. I have friends who still call me Al and I think I know people who still call me Allie because... Those were my names at various times in my life. Well, that means something's going on inside their head. They have a picture of our relationship, which is different from what I get from other people. I think I ought to relate to them in the way that is comfortable for them. So I don't have to come in playing a character that I think I am. I can play the, I can, I can be to them who they are to me. It's not phony, I don't think. No, in a way, what I'm hearing is, a level of vulnerability to other people that I think we find harder and harder to do as we get older, maybe. It's harder to do. As, uh, pro- I think you're probably right. It's probably harder as we get older, and it's harder as our, our culture goes through these harsh times where people have their minds made up about other people before they even find out much about them. And that's the fun part of, of other people. Other people are just a bother unless you can engage in the fun of finding out more about them. They're, it's, like, it's like looking at the sky and looking at how different the clouds are. And that's fun. Well, people are different, and they're fun, too, to explore. Some people are annoying. But, <laughs> but you know what's, what's amazing that I've found is I really work on trying to build my empathy up and to keep it as strong as I can. And I find the more empathy I have going for me, the less annoying other people are. (laughs) That makes sense when you put it that way. You know, it's not cynical to say that. A John Paul Sartre wrote the play uh, No Exit, and it was four people stuck in a railway car, and then they find out that they're actually in hell. And his point was that hell is other people. (laughs) <laughs> because I mean he had it for 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 many of us it's something we have to figure out how to get around other people can be demanding they can want us to do things or provide them with things that we don't think are right and we have to constantly negotiate with other people but the way to negotiate is more like what Chris Voss said on the on the podcast on clear and vivid not to impose not to try to impose our will on them but to give them strength, give them the sense that they're somebody and they have, they have a positive attitude about their contribution to the conversation. Mm-hmm. That, don't you find, did you find, if you listen to some of the podcasts, didn't you find that was a theme that kept running through it? That kind of surprised me. Yes. Yes. Yes, for sure. Oh, that surprised you too? 
Yeah, it did. I mean, the idea that they could put it in terms of let the other person know that they have power and mm-hmm. don't don't disempower them by bombarding them with your point of view. Let them, like when, when Chris Voss, the hostage negotiator, said, let them say, get them to the point where they say that's right, not you're right, because then they're giving in, whereas that's right means they're declaring something to be true, and they have the power. We're going to take a quick break here in our conversation with Alan Alda. When we come back, we're going to hear about his conversations on Clear and Vivid with Cheryl Strayed and Michael J. Fox, plus why he decided to go public with his own Parkinson's diagnosis. That in our show notes, Leanne. All right, we're back. On Clear and Vivid, Alan Alda had a fascinating conversation with Cheryl Strayed about the pressure she felt doing her own advice podcast and column, Dear Sugar. So I asked him about it. When you spoke with Cheryl Strayed about giving advice, that it definitely filtered into that conversation because it was surprising to hear she was surprised how much of herself she put into those responses. Like she thought it was going to be a quick buck and, and really, sm- you know, kind of snappy, smarmy Dear advice. Sugar, yeah, yeah. And then like 15 years later, it's like sucked everything out of her <laughs> because yeah. she realizes that like she does have something to contribute and these people have given her something. I, yeah, I found that conversation very uh, enlightening as well. And th- th- that's a good example of what we've just been saying. Here's she was in the position of giving advice. And most of us would think of that as a one-way street. I know something that'll help you. Here's what it is. And after I finish telling you, you, goodbye. On the contrary, she found she found herself lying awake at night thinking, what is this person going through? How can I reach this person? And then thinking of crises in her own life that might have, might throw light on the other person's problem. But in a way, still not giving conventional advice, but sharing experiences, trying to find it together in a way. That's a whole other thing. Yes. it's Yeah, well, it's a completely different goal, really, in your interactions with people. Yeah, and again, it's not that you give over your power to the other person. It's that you don't let them feel they're powerless. You know, you have always in all of your work, your writing, your speeches, and now Unclear and Vivid, you really encourage all of us to be able to talk about the hard things in our lives. And this summer, you let the world know that you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Was that a hard thing to reveal? Uh, it, It was to some extent, only because, I think mainly because I didn't want it to become the signature of my life. I didn't want it to become my identity. My first impulse when I when I got the diagnosis was that I wanted to tell other people about it because I realized that I had it before the doctors did. And it was an example of early detection. And it wasn't until I had a scan that the doctors realized I was right because I realized I, I had this thing with uh, acting out my dreams, which turns out to be a predictor of for many people of uh, Parkinson's. I saw it was inevitable that people would see my tremors, so I thought I might as well come out with it and get it over with. And, and so far, it hasn't really defined me. It, it usually comes up as one question in an interview, if it comes up at all. Your podcast season premiere this week is a, is a conversation with Michael J. Fox. Tell us, what, what was that like? That, well, that was a wonderful conversation. Michael was one of the first people I told that I had the diagnosis. And even though I don't want to be a a poster boy for that disease or any disease, I thought it would really be fun and helpful if Michael and I talked on the podcast about our experiences. We have a couple of fun strains in the conversation, a couple of threads where we compare notes on how we get our shirts unbuttoned. (laughs) And, you know... (laughs) <laughs> it's there, there. There are special problems you have, and it's fun to talk about it with somebody who shares the problem. But you do have to adjust. You have to make adjustments. But you got to make adjustments in life just to stay alive. You have mm-hmm. to adjust to getting older. Your body parts rust and fall off. You got to get <laughs> used to that. I assume for both of you, both you and Michael J. Fox, that 
humor helps you get through some of these harder moments. And we've always felt that way as a family. When we, when I think about our family dynamics, I think I'm very grateful that there are times like in the difficult, darker times that we, we can usually find a way to some humor. So what do you, what do you sisters do? Do you get together at Thanksgiving, and what's that like? Do you have an Uncle Louie that you have to work with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, now both of our parents have passed away now, so it's it's on us to get together. So we often see each other in smaller subsets. So this Thanksgiving, Leon and I will be together, but Julie, you'll be with your grandchildren in Dallas, right? That's correct, yes. yes. And we'll be talking about... Uh, we'll be talking at our Thanksgiving about their Thanksgiving, um, mm. Alan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Competing. But, what, what, you'll be talking at your Thanksgiving about their Thanksgiving? What do you mean? <laughs> Whose is well, better? Well, competing. Who can do it better? <laughs> <laughs> <We're very> oh. <laughs> oh, so, so, so just, you're not the satellite sisters. You're the competitive sisters. <laughs> uh, you know, it's part of the brand. Part of the brand. But I will say that... I will say that earlier this fall, we had a birthday party in our family for one of our sisters who was turning 60, and it was the first time in a while that all eight of the adult children had been together, and there were some trepidations. Not everyone always gets along perfectly, so I think all of us had to kind of rise above a little bit and, and rally, and it was it was such a pleasure to all be together, but I know that that wasn't necessarily easy for everyone in the moment. And it's good to get together for a happy occasion because there are plenty of times when you get together for sad occasions, you know. I know. And to take, especially Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, which probably most people regard as one of the best, if not the best holidays, because it's mainly people getting together and expressing thanks for the things in life that are worth thanking for. But to turn that into a brawl is a shame. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to try hard. <laughs> this, we've got the skills now. You've given us the tools. The no knives. Yeah, but, the... but I'm, like, I'm like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. I'm no good at it <laughs> all the time. Being willing to be changed is the same thing as getting an education. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't go to college to have the same ideas you went in with. You go in to try to understand things under the surface um, and more broadly to find out what the history of things are, what, how, the, how things work in the inner mechanics of nature. Those are all things that you don't have when you go in. So you hope to be changed by a college education or any education. You hope to be changed if somebody's helping you with your golf swing or your <laughs> tennis racket, right? Right. It's not such a far-fetched idea. Travel does the same thing. That really it, Sure, yeah. And there's no reason that conversation can't be the same thing, even when talking to somebody you're pretty sure you don't agree with. Well, you know, the slogan for Satellite Sisters has always been, not every conversation will change your life, but any conversation can. So I think we're on the same plane here. <laughs> I know, it's getting boring. <laughs> okay, so there's one last thing. We're trying to get people, you know, in, we're trying to get everyone who's listening to this in the right emotional headspace for the holidays. Like that we want them listening to this as they're traveling home for Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's or whatever their family or, and friends or celebration e- is. even three hours later when they're traveling back home and they've skipped dinner because the first few minutes didn't work. <laughs> So, okay, so what's your last piece of advice you would give to people or the thing you want them to have uppermost in their mind when they walk into that home where their friends and family are for the holidays? Just listen and smile and have fun. (laughs) Find something to have fun about. Laugh. Laugh. Laughing is good. Laugh. Yes. Okay. We will leave it on that note. Ellen Alda, thank you for being such a solid gold satellite mister. We prescribe episodes of Clear and Vivid with Alan Alda during your holiday travels, no matter who you are. And we will have links to that in our show notes. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. We really appreciate it. This was just like last time. So much fun. Thank you, all of you. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. You You too. Bye-bye. That was great. I I just love him. I just love listening to Alan Alda, don't don't you? Just his voice. Yes. It's so soothing. Uh, So we're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, sisters, 
We need to talk about the lessons we'll take away from this conversation. Were we open to really having our minds changed? Hmm, let's just see about that. All right, Liz. I yeah, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like maybe what well, we okay. can discuss, we can discuss. I want to remind listeners that we do a weekly show. We have literally hundreds and hundreds of podcast episodes. You can go to SatelliteSisters.com, SatelliteSisters.com, and use the search feature. If you want to find our first Alan Alda interview, it's there. I also want to draw your attention to a recent interview we did with a mother and a, a writer named Maureen Kavanaugh. She saw her daughter through an opioid addiction. And I, there was just a similar humanity in the mm -hmm. interview with Maureen to, you know, yeah, just speaking with Alan Alda. Yeah. So another, like, when life takes you down a path you don't expect, how you cope with kind of grace and ferocity and openness and tenderness. And so that uh, you can find at SatelliteSisters.com if you just search Maureen Cavanaugh or look for our uh, Satellite Sisters book club pick for October. You'll find that there. That was a super book and a super interview. All right. We'd like to thank our sponsors, of course, at Satellite Sisters. They're the ones that keep us going. We are back. And you know, when we decided to do this special, it's because we wanted to get some inspiration for going home for the holidays with love and respect in our heart, right? <laughs> so that we could really have the best possible frame of mind. And honestly, Leanne and Julie, I never thought I'd get so much advice from a hostage negotiator about how to handle the Thanksgiving dinner table. But when you think about it, sometimes you do have that feeling of being trapped, <laughs> you know, whether it's just dinner or being home for an extended stretch, you know, where, you know, it's fun to be back with your family and friends most of the time. But there are times when you really just have to, like, you know, take it cool. And I thought the hostage negotiator had a lot of good points about how to do that. Uh, <laughs> what did you think? Well, the one I really resonated with was when he said, find some common ground. Like, yeah. Even if you are talking to someone who you don't really have a lot in common with, there must be some common ground. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some issues I feel like, well, where's the common ground there, Alan? But, you know, you know what's common ground for almost everybody is television. So I <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I know he meant like when they're, you know, when they're giving their opinion on position A and you're taking position Z, somewhere in the middle, there's common ground. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I also think television is just everybody's common ground, common ground if all else fails. Yeah. So that's what I but I, I did. You know, listen, I love listening to that podcast, Clear and Vivid. I learned something every single episode. He does an amazing job. And then hearing him talk today, it is an inspiration. You know? I think what's so hard about finding common ground is that sometimes you go into the, these conversations not wanting to give an inch, right? right? Like you're dug in, the other person is dug in. Right. You're not open to really having your mind changed because you're so focused on changing their mind. Yeah. But if we could really let all of that go, right. common ground might appear. It's still a long shot in mm -hmm. some of these cases, mm -hmm. But it it only has the possibility of appearing I, if you're not trying to just actively change someone's mind. It's 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 really about having a very different conversation with people, because if you're just if you're not willing to be changed by what you hear, that that if you don't enter into the conversation that way, then, you know, then it's it's going to be a different conversation. It requires you to be to be open, to listen, to be humble, to let the other person know they have power, you know, to to give over on certain things, I, I think is it really made me sort of think about the how I approach conversations. Am I doing that? Am I willing to be being changed? And uh and I'm going to take Leanne's advice, too, to talk about TV and food and sports and <laughs> things like that. But I but I but you have to you do have to be open to communicating differently, you know, not yeah. just putting out your point of view, but, yeah. be, you know, to really be open to a change of opinion, you know, which we don't want to change. No, do we, we don't want to change. I mean, one thing he said when we were warming up, which the audience did not hear, is that in his family on New Year's Eve, they play a game where they each make predictions for the new year. And that would be a good conversation to have. That is. Like that's, you know, then you're really yeah. hearing what's on people's minds or what their goals and aspirations are. You can have fun with that. Some of that can be serious. So, you know, that's something that is really kind of a fun thing. 
Liz, you and I went to a party the other night that was kicked off. It was a room of strangers, and we all had to stand up and introduce ourselves and say either what we were thinking about, like what's been on our minds lately, or what we were thankful for. Yes. And I you know, I know millions of Americans do that every Thanksgiving, but not us. We've never... <laughs> <laughs> Have we ever publicly? We do de- a little gratitude. Oh. Yes, I think we, there's some grace saying, on, but we well, don't. We say we grace. Don't do it that, yeah, yes, it's not but formal. Not in, not in a formal free form. Right. But that would be interesting to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah because is- this was very personal, Julie. Everyone got up, and it was like 30 people, and so a room of 30 strangers. Well, I knew Leon and her husband. Yeah, um, but mainly strangers. It's a good way to get to know people to just hear what are they really thinking about. And maybe we can put the headlines behind us. Maybe we can put the elections behind us. There are other things to think about in the world. That's the thing, too. There are other things to discuss. Right. Yeah, with this group, it was not a super political. People people were much more personal than political. Uh, That's what I would say. And so I I thought it was a good, good gambit. Yeah, and I also think his point about emotional empathy, you know, really... Really trying, you know, as he did as an actor, getting into the role, you know, into roles, he would really have to think about the emotional makeup of his characters. But if if we stop to do that, you know, in our daily conversations, that that's that's a big thing we can, you know, I can work on. That was it was inspiring. I I can't say I'm going to do it all the time, but I know I'm inspired by it. I know know, because half the time I really don't want to hear what you think. (laughs) <laughs> that's I, very I honest admit that. that is part yeah. of the problem oh, really yeah. on certain subjects i am not interested in your opinion oh, oh, so yeah. like how do you i don't know how do you dig in without just changing the subject <laughs> one key though and i used to practice this like in the corporate environment and i think it's even more important within a circle of family and and friends is not ascribing evil intent to people's opinions, right? Because yeah. that's a way we have of demonizing even the people that are close to us. And yes. maybe there are lots of reasons why people believe what they believe. And it's not necessarily because they're a bad person. I mean, it, right. it might be. But you can't assume that they have some evil vision for the world or they are an evil person. And I think sometimes we associate certain opinions with bad faith. And maybe if we could just, again, like when you're at the table, get rid of that assumption and explore a little bit more, you might, yep. you might have your mind changed. I right. mean, I, on most things, I doubt it, but I'm open. I'm open. <laughs> All I can think of when you said that was if someone really did an impassioned plea for cats versus dogs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you think, are not hearing it. <laughs> I'm not hearing it. I'm not hearing it, I'm, but I'm willing to not listen. Not even a little bit? I'm willing. Not, actually, no, I like cats. They're very yeah, nice. Yeah. I'm just allergic yeah. to them. I know why yeah. some people like cats, but that doesn't mean you have to like them. Right. Right? <laughs> Everybody has a right to a cat. Here we are hey, in a Liz, family I of dogs. I think you're clamming up. Okay. <laughs> Liz, I think you're clamming up on this. Don't do it. Don't go there. The, stay open. Yeah. Remember? I am going to try to stay open. So, you know, Julie, you're always good at wrapping it up for us here at Satellite Sisters. What would be your closing thought of this discussion? Because we started by saying that we're always about the sense of connection and trying to maintain that and nurture that. Anything else you want to close with? Well, you know, it came up earlier, but I don't I don't think you can say it enough. You know, we say on Satellite Sisters that not every conversation will change your life, but any conversation can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we just have to live it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It's been no, a it's slogan, true. but now, <laughs> now, it's, now it's more than a slogan. Yeah. That's true, though. It's yeah. true. In the true sense of conversation, which means listening as well as talking. That's the dilemma. Exactly. <laughs> Liz, I just want to let people know we do have another special coming up. And this, I think, is one we can all come together on. Holiday food and entertaining. Yes. So, Yay. <laughs> Next week, right before Thanksgiving, we'll be posting our holiday food and entertaining special where we'll be just sounding off on some of our favorite recipes, our favorite food traditions, memorable meals we've had around the holiday. We hope it's great listening while you're preparing your own family meal. Yeah. Yeah. I am looking forward to recording that. And, you know, you can also visit our website where you'll find our shop and our archive. Leon talked about the Maureen Cavanaugh uh, interview you can find there. Believe it or not, we've got 
800 shows there just waiting to entertain you. And you'll also see in our show notes here the links where you can join our Facebook group and how to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We would like to thank our sponsors for this show. Many thanks to Rothy's. Many thanks to The New Yorker and to our new sponsor, Green Chef. Happy to have you on board here at Satellite Sisters. Special thanks to our engineer, Sergio Enriquez. And thanks to Alan Alda and his team at Alan Alda Communications for oh, making so great. this happen. Super, super happy to have this happen. Remember, his Michael J. Fox episode dropped this week, so that's going to be a great one. We're the Satellite Sisters. Don't forget, call your Satellite Sisters.